John Sweet is quite possibly the fittest 80-year-old man in America. This pioneer of the fitness industry spent 50 years traveling all around the world, working as a designer and consultant to various successful companies. John developed the first fitness manufacturing company in China while living in the cold and antiquated factory. John owned multiple successful gyms around the United States and even garnered attention from Arnold Schwarzenegger. At only 27 years old, John helped create the famous Otter Pops, the multi-flavored ice popsicle. Listen to many colorful stories about how this charismatic and fit ex-Marine became so successful after surviving a freak accident in his youth on this episode of A Tale to Tell. Good morning, John. Good morning, John. How are Thank you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you being here. My looking, pleasure. Looking forward to this. A lot of information to talk about, but let's just start from square one. Where were where did you grow up? Uh, primarily in um, Japan, my formative years from about the first grade to about the eighth grade. And, and why, why Japan? Uh, my father was stationed there. He was, the, he was a military officer during the war, and then he was at work for the government. And so you were there for seven, eight years? Did Almost you say? eight years. And then did, is that when you guys moved to California? Yes, I was born in California. That's where we originally left from, and then we came back to California. Okay. I obviously know you through the gym, and we're going to get to that, come full circle to the end of this, but how did you get involved with fitness, or with lifting weights in particular? Well, it actually started at a very young age when um, I was looking at, uh, during that time we had comic books and we had advertisement, and there was uh, advertisement that don't get sand kicked in your face, and I was spending a lot of time on beaches, and so I purchased my first set of dumbbells and started to exercise at home. I know you have a twin brother. Yes. So you would... He would lay he, in bed and watch me and he said, I'm just going to get as strong as you. You just keep working out. <laughs> but he didn't. And he you did. did. He yeah. Didn't. And then he got into it later. But so you were, you were inspired by Charles Atlas? Charles Atlas, that's right. Mm -hmm. And what, how did he inspire you? Well, it was, again, it was the advertising on the comic books and popular mechanics, and then you'd see this picture, and they're in black and white, and, and um, so I just decided that I didn't, want to have, I, I didn't want to have any problems on the beach. Great. I think a lot of kids probably started yeah, out that way. That's right. Now, were you involved with sports and whatnot I would say uh, in high school, I was a four-year letterman, but my real uh, forte was swimming because that's where I learned how to swim when I was overseas. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so did you swim for the school, or did they have swimming for Well, not for the school, contest? they had it for, this, for the city, and it was a summer program. Okay, and I, I'd like for you to tell the listeners a story about you and your lifeguard days and a, a very <laughs> amazing yes, tale yes. here. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Well, I was, uh, when I came back from Okinawa, that's, you know, it's Japan now, uh, we went to uh, Rio Vista, and um, I went up. First thing I did was look at the swimming pool, and said I want to be a lifeguard. And um, I applied for the lifeguard and became a lifeguard when I was 13, and um, was there until I was a manager until I was 19. And you know, but um, swimming has always been something that I was extremely interested in. And so you were a, you're a lifeguard, mm -hmm. and tell us that particular day when you were working as a lifeguard and got called? Well, at that time, uh, the town is, you know, it's a rural town, and uh, they would have a fire whistle that would go off, and, and um, or a siren, and we then all the volunteer firemen would have to report to the, to the firehouse, and then we'd get on our trucks and we'd go to the fire. So I was a manager of the pool, and I was in a bathing suit wearing a whistle, and the fire whistle went off, and I ran down to the firehouse just care, uh, in my bathing suit because I had my turnouts were on the truck, and I was hit by the chief of police in the, in the uh, uh, crosswalks. Hit by him? Hit by him. I broke his headlight. I, my twin brother watched me go as high as the uh, lamppost, I, and um, the, every, everything stopped, and the police were came, obviously the police because the chief of police is who hit me, and um, 
they turned, they, you know, they took me to the doctor's office and there wasn't one scratch bruise on me. And, um, unbelievable. And unbelievable. And it, um, I went to, in fact, at that day, and if a fire happened during the lunch hour, they would buy free lunch. So I, I ended up <laughs> going down to the place where everybody's having lunch and they couldn't believe that I'd walk back in and after getting hit by a, a car, it hit me at 30 miles an hour. I mean, it's amazing that you weren't dead, one, but no broken bones, no nothing, concussion, nothing. not even bruised or scratched. No, nothing. Yeah, that's a, was, that's a it, miracle. Yeah. My goodness. One of many. So, John, let's fast forward a little bit. You, uh, you graduate high school and you decide you're going to go to college. I went to college. And where, where did you go to school? We went to Stockton College, my brother and I, for, for the first two years. And then right across the street was University Pacific. And uh, we, could we could go across and take classes over there. And uh, my brother and I took the, one of the very first uh, uh, weight training classes. And, uh, this is what year? This was in 1962. Interesting. And, uh, so you go to school for how many years? I went to school. Then, there. We went to Stockton. They went to San Jose. And then I left in my uh, third year in 63. I went and joined the MARCAD, the Marine Aviation. My twin brother and I were uh, Marine, uh, uh, Marine students. Tell us a little bit about how you decided to join the Marines with your previous <laughs> to your brother joining. Yeah, my twin brother. Somehow, I, my brother and I used to, you know, when we were on the campus, we were always a little bit together. But for some reason, I we were separated. I walked by the kiosk. The Marine Corps was... Um, uh, recruiting pilots, and uh, I wanted was one to fly, and so I went in and took the test right there on the campus. And they said, "You pass. Go down to uh, Naval Air Station Alameda, take the physical." So I took the and I went. I drove down there without telling my brother, and um, went down there and, and took the physical. And they said, "You pass." And I said, "Oh, good. Do you want to join?" Yes. I raised my right hand, swore in, came home or came back to where we were living. And I told my brother, I said, hey, Bob, guess what? I just joined the Marine Corps. I'm going to be a pilot. He said, well, what am I going to do? And I said, well, you're going to join with me. So he took the test, went down past the program, and we both went in together. He retired. I got out early. He got out as a colonel and uh, flew helicopters and fixed wing. And um, so I start, he said that I was the one who started his career. Oh my gosh! And when you when you got home to tell your folks, because I know your dad was a my father, lifetime military man in the army, and you had a couple other brothers who were army. Army, army. But what did your dad tell you, boys? Before him being an army man, you guys are now joining the yeah. the Marines. What was his well, What was we, his comment? We decided that we were going to drop out of school. Not decided, we did it, and so we dropped. We, and we went home to tell my dad, and my dad was sitting at the dining room table, and we sat down said, hey, Dad, we have something to tell you. I said, what? And he said, uh, Bob and I are dropping out of school and joined the Marine Corps. We're going to be pilots. And he goes, what? He said, uh, are you? And he said, where are you in the process? And we said, well, we've already sworn in. And he said, he turned to us, and he said, there's only two good things about the Marine Corps. And then we said, what's that? He said, you and your brother. <laughs> oh, man. So, I mean, he obviously supported you guys. Oh, he and was he, very, very proud of yeah, us. That's, Extremely proud. That's fantastic. So, John, you end up getting out of the Marines, and you decide you're going to start working in the L.A. area? Is that where I you live? Back to Stockton. My dad was transferred to a military base uh, outside of Manteca. And um, so um, I didn't know, quite know what I wanted to do, and there was a management training program, and my father was, um, he knew somebody that uh, was with this company, and, and um, I went there and applied, and I became a management trainee. And I worked there for about a year before I went down to Los Angeles. And what did you do in L.A.? In L.A., I was um, a diver because my, bro my father had sent me and my three brothers uh, to diving school, scuba diving. Uh, he had this uh, dream of us going up into the American River and looking for gold through it. And, um, and so we went to diving school up in Sacramento, and then 
Um, none of us used it, with the exception of my little brother later on in his life when he became a marine archaeologist, and uh, he do dove all over the world. But when I was going to school in, in uh, Cal State Fullerton, I was a diver, and I would um, go to Long Beach or to Newport Beach and work on sail, most primarily sailboats and some power boats, and uh, work on changing props and propellers or cleaning boats in the morning, and then I would go to class in the afternoon. Okay, so cold, uh, a very cold job. Very cold, and that's why uh, in the winter I, I got an ear infection, and, um, and it was cold, and there was... And so I said, I got to get inside. I got to get warm. And, I, and um, I applied for a job working for American Hospitals Supply, which was a division, and the division was me, v. Mueller, surgical instruments. Okay, so what did you do there? What was your job? I there? was on the on the order desk, and um, the hospitals or purchasing agents would call us, call me, and and. Um, I would uh, take orders over the desk. Now tell us a little bit about how you got that job, though. Well, I um, I applied, and they came, and they said, okay, and that, and uh, they said, go in the back room and into this warehouse in this office, and they handed me a test. It was a short test. I think it was only 50 or 100 questions. And um, so I took the test in, all, in a room all by myself with a bunch of boxes, and... Um, uh, I handed them the test, and they took it back, and they came came back and said, uh, we'd like you to take it again. <laughs> Pardon me? And they said, we'd like... It was a different... It was the same format, but different questions on it. So they gave me the test again, and I took the test again, and then they asked me to come in, and I interviewed and said, you're hired. And so <laughs> they took me over to the desk and put me in the desk and said, all right, and then the receptionist said, you're on line one, John. And I go, what? And but that's how I got trained. And I had to learn things like Fogarty arterial embolectomy catheters. That was just one of a, of a thousand items. And so they just threw you into the fire. Uh, yeah, just, you had no idea. Uh, zero yeah, training. Zero training. And um, so after I'd been there for about a couple of weeks, I asked them, why did you ask me to take the test twice? They said, "Well, you, you scored too high on the first one, and we thought maybe you might be. There could be some possible cheating." Oh my and, gosh! Um, so yeah. how, so how long were you with them? I was there for about a year, going to school and, and working there, and then one of the ladies in the in the uh, in the office, her husband was made president of a company of a bubble up. And a bubble up's a soft drink. Soft drink. I remember that. And. Okay. Um, the division he was made president was called National Packets Corporation, and she liked my my work ethic and came to me and asked me if I'd like to work for her, her husband. And her father, her husband, interviewed me, and he hired me as uh, his plant manager for this company up in Canoga Park. Now was that a little overwhelming as well, being a well, plant manager first, so young? I was 26, and um, the the first day I walked in, uh, the employees were on strike and um, Mr. Lundstrom, who was the president, turned to me and said, hey, you're the plant manager, go handle it. <laughs> and so I went in, right into a strike. I hadn't, been in, I hadn't been in the office for, I think, a half hour before I was... That was your first job. My there. first job. And so how did you handle the, the employees? I, I asked them, I, I told them basically that I had just come on board and that I would um, do everything that my utmost to get this thing resolved. And the only thing I knew how to say was please. So I said, por favor. They looked at me, turned around, and went back to their back to work. Fantastic. So he had to be pleased with that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and how long were you with them? About a year and a half. And then they uh, they, they had some management changes, management changes, and um, they let Mr. Lundstrom go and and uh, let. And I became the president of the company, and I and and during that period of time, we introduced Otter Pops. I was just going to say you you are the guy yes. that started Otter Pops, and I think yes. hopefully a handful of people at least listen to this the concept, know what Otter Pops are. Yeah, the concept came from actually a marketing company from Bubble Up, and uh, but they didn't know how to uh, 
you know, to manufacture it. They didn't have the formulas. They didn't have the artwork. There was just a concept. And um, I, I was very much involved in that because in my team, there was only one. And that was me. And it was you. You were designing the flavors and you were telling this taste. Mm -hmm. This is good. This is bad. This is too sweet. That's this is just right. That's it. Everything. That's, that's remarkable. The one thing I learned about this was one of my first things I learned about business was that that decisions have to be made, and if you're if you're the person that's uh, that has to make that decision, you make the decision. So, John, after Bubble Up, what what transpired there? What? Well, the the company uh, Bubble Up uh, was um, caught or caught st uh, selling stock before they went public. And so they were closed down. The FBI came and closed them. And um, so... While you were there. While I was there, I came... That would be shocking. Yes. I drove to uh, Century City where the headquarters were, turned in my car keys, and um, hitchhiked a ride home. And it was over. And then a company that came, was very interested in buying my, com uh, buying my company, or my, pre my company... Uh, did not buy it because of various reasons, and they hired me uh, to um, uh, enter the fitness industry, and that's how I got there. So there are a bunch of other gentlemen involved in this whole process, but the main guy was interested in you because he knew you were the guy that did it all. Yeah. Correct. Yes. So you had a lot of a lot of people that worked there that were tremendously mm -hmm. mad at you. Not very happy with me because the. <laughs> The person that uh, was be looked at, to, he, he was being, uh, he had showed some interest in the company, and at the final meeting, he asked me if I would buy the company, and I said no. And uh, then he said, he told everybody else that was in the meeting that he wasn't buying the company, and they were very, very upset with me. And uh, so they walked out, and as I was leaving uh, the meeting, uh, the gentleman turned to me and said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I'm going to look for a job. And he said, you want to work for me? And I said, doing what? And he said, manufacturing fitness equipment. Okay, so that's how you got your start in yeah. fitness equipment. So then you ended up working for who? Who, who was that company? That fitness was Paramount. Paramount, Paramount Fitness. There Which I'm familiar with. There, there were just a few companies back then. Was this early 70s? There was, yes, this was in 1972. There were about three major companies one was uh, Universal, which was primarily into the school market. The other one, as everybody has heard of, is Nautilus. And then, my, and then my company, which was Paramount. And John, you were instrumental in creating what with Paramount? Well, we, um, one of the things that each, uh, like I said before, Universal was in the school market. They were using two-inch round tubing. Uh, Nautilus was in, in club market. And, and they were using inch and a quarter, inch and a half square tubing, and uh, we were using solid steel, chrome plated. We were more like a boutique type of equipment. We didn't have the credibility of being a real fitness company, so I decided to uh, come up with a sports trainer line, and we used uh, square bent tubing. And, which no one had done. Which is now. It's, it's the it's, standard. Yeah, it's standard. And we were the first company. You're just that. a pioneer, creating Otter Pops and a new way to develop <laughs> weight machines. Yeah, I mean, exactly. really, that's that's really yeah. tremendous. Yeah. Well, so you're with Paramount Fitness. Um, let's fast forward a little bit. You ended up having some of your own facilities, uh, yeah. as far as gyms go, right? Yeah. You were. Yeah. Where, you tell us about that. Well, one of our customers from Las Vegas came in, and he was buying our equipment. And um, he uh, ran into some, he, 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 was, he was older, retired, and uh, he and I started talking, we got friendly, and he said, how would you like to buy my four clubs and, um, in uh, Las Vegas? And actually, there were two double-doubles. In other words, at that time, there was a women's club and men's club, and they were in the same facility. And um, one was on Maryland Parkway, and the other one was on Sierra. Because back then, men and women just didn't exercise together, correct? No, we yeah. didn't. We, yeah. we had separate staffs. We had male staffs, female staffs. It was, you know, it was like four different companies. Wow. So you were operating four gyms. Four companies, yeah. Which was really almost like eight. 
if you think about oh, it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that had to be very difficult because you guys, you had wet areas too. It wasn't just fitness equipment, right? Did you guys have pools and we had swimming pools, jacuzzis, jacuzzis and yes. Uh, any any interesting stories up there with uh, that yeah, occurred I, when? My interesting story is that um, at one time when I was with Paramount, uh, we were looking for a spokesman or a sponsor, a spokesman person, and uh, I sat down with Arnold Schwarzenegger um, for dinner. It was just him and I, and we were talking about we were talking about you know him. Uh, sponsoring us, and he was he had just made the movie Conan, and um, so uh, we were, you know, and he want, he wanted a quite a large amount of money for it, and I don't blame him. And um, so um, we did not reach a deal, and and part of the contract that he sent us that he didn't want to have free limousine service, and um, which I thought was a little bit over the top, but that's my own opinion. But um, <laughs> So now, fast forward, I have the clubs in Vegas, and uh, they have a TV program, and they want Arnold Schwarzenegger to come in the show, into one of the fitness centers. So they called me and said, can Arnold Schwarzenegger, and can we shoot an uh, afternoon in your fitness center with your instructors and everything else? And I said, sure. So Arnold, Arnold came down with all the, you know, everybody was there, and the camera people, and, and uh, so they had, did the shoot, and, and um, they had a limousine out front. He was going to go to a radio station, and the limousine had a flat tire in it. So he needed, he was a, there was a time constraint, and he needed to get to the radio station to do his interview, and he had no car. And so the people said, is there somebody that can take him? And so I said, yeah, I'll take Arnold. So Arnold got in my, into my car, and I was driving to the radio station, and I turned to Arnold and I said, do you remember me, Arnold? And he said, yeah, he said, thought he did. He said, remember when you asked for, uh, you wanted a limousine <laughs> service? Well, you really got it. Now you got it, now buddy. you got it. <laughs> Four years later. Uh, you know, that's that's fantastic. And I know you had some clubs in Minnesota as well. And yes, then, that was my... Then you the, came the, back to Los Angeles. And then you did a hell of a lot of traveling in your career. How did you end up over in China? Well, I, I was... You know, I was working and I was doing some consulting, and um, uh, a company contacted me. I don't know how they got my. Uh, they even kind of found me and they contacted me because, uh, because they had a joint venture in China, and they um, they thought that my background in Japan was um, going to be helpful. Well, there's two different countries. Let me assure you, and uh, so I. Kind of hesitated because I wasn't. I was interested in going to Japan. I was interested in going to Taiwan, but I wasn't interested in China. Well, I was talked into it, and I and I was only going to be there for two weeks. And they were med medical products was what I was going to go back there and look at. And so I went to China uh, for a two week uh, consulting base on a consulting basis, and um, it was like home and and. So the uh, like home in the sense of how people treated you treated me. I could use chopsticks, I, even though the, because you know, that's I, you were first through eighth grade and in Japan. Just, you did similar stuff, do, right? Yeah. Yes. So I was very comfortable there, and there were no, there were a couple other Americans there, and they just couldn't stand it because this is this was in eighty eighty nine, and January of eighty nine, and uh, so. Uh, uh, they left, and so the doctor asked me, said, would you stay for a couple more weeks? And I stayed, and I ended up staying there for 28 years. Wow. Uh, what were the conditions like there? Well, uh, in my particular case, and let me step back, I was there, and I didn't know a lot of foreigners or Americans that were working over there. I was kind of isolated, and I thought everybody lived like this. And so I was in the third floor of a of a building that we were man we were uh, converting uh, to apartments uh, where I was going to live. And um, so uh, there was no foreigners around that I was aware of or knew or any around. And the conditions were extremely uh, cold and, and there was no heat and, and... No heat in the whole building? No heat in the whole building. 
because it was under construction and the construction workers were in the other apartment and they um, for them to be uh, warm they lived in cardboard boxes with uh, light bulbs oh that my were on. Goodness. I had the only little heater in my room and I had uh, I actually had a bed and I had some quilts and that's how I lived for you and, it was luxury and that was luxury and again I go back and thinking that, that everybody's got to be living like this and uh, later on I found out that um, I was probably much so much I was an exception now were there was there running water were there restrooms no, they were, were there were no restrooms and and I don't know how to say this but uh, uh, one time I got up and I went over to their room like that and the guy was urinating out the window on the third floor and I said enough enough guys this is it we're not doing it you're gonna walk down this down to the floor we had some toilets that were in the dormitories and they could use that but they were just it was too darn cold they were too lazy to go down there and um, so we um, uh, so I made a rule that they couldn't pee out the window my gosh and how long did you live like that I lived there for maybe four months because of construction it was all during the winter and um, but I lived in after we've uh, completed the uh, uh, the renovation uh, I lived there for almost a year and a half. And, wow. Uh, wow. Luxury. Oh. So y you were actually there when Tiananmen Square was, was Tiananmen invaded. Square. Yes. I and was, you were there, I not just there. in the country. I mean, you were, and you had a, tell us about that experience. Well, I, my plane, I was in Los Angeles and I flew in there on uh, China Air and we were late coming out of San Francisco. And so I landed uh, at night, or just at, at dusk, and um, uh, that's when the shooting started happening. So I was in Beijing, and I was driving, and the people were running, and people were... We, I didn't know what was going on. I was going to the hotel, and um, uh, we got, I got to the hotel, and the next morning, there was this very somber, the employees, everybody was just uh, quiet, it, you could just... It's almost like being in a wake. And um, then we found out that they had uh, cleared the square and it, uh, there was killings and our office building was shot up. And, and um, wow. you know, um, I stayed for until uh, we heard that there was going to be a civil war between the two armies. Because the army that came in that, sh that killed the students, it was not the original army. The, the original army got two... Uh, too friendly with the uh, with the citizenry, so they took them out and put this other uh, PLA in there, People's Liberation Army from the north, who had no no feelings for them. That's who did all the shooting. And, and did uh, you have any close yeah. contact with any uh, soldiers yes, or anything? One, I had close because about seven eight days I was going out to the try to get out because we heard there might be a civil war. And um, so my car was stopped out outside of the airport, and AK-47 was put to my head. Oh, and, boy. And, um, and then finally uh, I told my interpreter and my assistant uh, to tell him I'm sick. And uh, then an officer came up and then let us, told me I was sick and needed to go to the airport. And I, and uh, he let me pass and go, and uh, I was fortunate to get on the airplane. That must have aged you a few years. Well, I mean, it was just kind of like it was surreal. I mean, I, you, you kind of just kind of in a haze, and um, so um, I was very fortunate to get out in in time and not have this uh, problem. So you obviously stayed in China, and well, I went back to the United States. Okay, and then uh, they asked me to come back. Came back. And can you believe I came back and two weeks later? But I went down to Hong Kong and then came through Qingdao, and bypassed Beijing and then stayed out in the countryside in Shandong province in a small town called Laiwu, which is, um, and I was told I was the only foreigner within 250 miles. And so I lived out there in a, I like to say, a, a, a one-star hotel <laughs> for two or three months by myself. Wow. And um, working with this particular company that was uh, making medical products. And John, is that how you met your wife? Because um, I know you have a, you're a lucky man. You're 80 years old. You're married to a woman who's 55-ish. That's correct. So here you are at 
roughly 50. Yes, correct. And she's 25. Tell I'm us. 30, 30 years old. She was 30. Or 30, was, sorry. Yeah, and I was, yeah. And so you were? 30, I was 50. 50, okay. 51. Okay, so tell, tell us a little bit about well, what you're doing there and how you guys met. Well, during a time, my friend, <coughs> well, I, let me start again because this is kind of, and I want to make it short. Um, not my marriage, I just want to make this, <laughs> I, want to make my, I want to make my story short. Um, I, there was a friend of our, a distributor of ours, well, let me jump back. When I got back to the States, I became the president of another gym, a company called Cal, Cal Gym, which is now called uh, Tough Stuff. Oh yeah, familiar. So I was there and I was doing both. I was in China and the United States supplying cast iron cast iron and, and um, uh, components to my original company. Um, Cal, uh, the, the company was sold. I went back to China and uh, one of my distributors in Hong Kong asked me to take this company over in Shanghai. And so it was a, a manufactured x-ray equipment and I converted the, uh, the manufacturer to a fitness manufacturer. We were one of the very first fitness manufacturers in China. Wow. And so during that time, my Chinese was very poor. I'd like to say it's very good, but it's still marginal. <laughs> and um, so I, need, I had this interpreter that I'd had for like 10, 12 years. And um, he had to go back up to, Gen uh, up to North and I needed an interpreter. So my HR department uh, advertised for an interpreter and my wife was one of the applicants, and um, out of out of five, so I interviewed her, and I was very very impressed because she was already training, exercising. She was running uh, at the uh, college, which was right, very close to us, and I was impressed. And the, the Chinese women at that time were outside of their sports teams. Were don't, they didn't exercise. They didn't want muscles. They didn't want everything. And here I had this lady, woman there. I didn't hire, and this is, and the reason I didn't hire her was she wanted too much money, and for starting, <laughs> and that I didn't had to loot, raise all my managers, and I wasn't, and there's no secrets in China, and so I didn't want to raise, I didn't want to have to raise all the managers as well to, so um, I hired her uh, for two weeks because I needed to make an. A, these, uh, I, I needed to uh, have a, a meeting with the uh, city of Shanghai on uh, setting up the qualifications and standards of manufacturing fitness equipment. And during the two weeks, uh, the Marine Corps birthday came. It was in no, it was in November 10th, by the way. And um, so a very good friend of mine, he was a professor. Uh, he was a Marine. Kept asking me and bugging me to come over and say. Wanted, you know, let's go to the Marine Corps birthday. And I said, I don't know anybody. I'm here to work. And he said, what? And pointed to my my future wife and said, take her. And I, once you ask her, and I said, I don't, I don't hire, I don't date employees. And he said, she's not an employee. She's just temporary. <laughs> so, and we, so I went and asked her, and she said yes. And that was our first date, the Marine Corps birthday. That was a big deal in Shanghai. There was about four or five hundred people there, orchestra, carved glass, carved ice. Uh, it was uh, very, very nice, and she just absolutely beautiful. And um, so I was smitten. So and let me ask you this. How did her family feel about this interracial relationship? Her family, are two, her mother and father are both doctors, and they live in Chongqing. And they were very skeptical and, and uh, wanted to know what my intentions were. And um, so this, and my, my, my parents were also skeptical and wanted to know what her intentions were. So I told her, I said, you tell, tell your parents that my parents are just as worried about you as you are worried about, uh, that she's worried about, they worried about me. Mm -hmm. So that kind of put that away. Sure. And so you guys stayed there for many years. Did she get a MBA? She, she got an MBA in China. No, she would. Oh. So I, we got married when she was in her second semester, her second year in at uh, Southern, uh, in uh, in California. Okay. And um, so um, she was. She got an MBA from there. 
Fantastic. And you guys stayed in California for some time? No. She, as, soon as, she got, she, as soon as she graduated from Southern Cal, uh, then she went back to China. I was living in China. Or I was in China. I never came back. And she came back, and I said, well, I think it's time to finally meet your parents. So she said, yes, so that, since we got married. We got married in Hawaii. And um, so we flew back to Chongqing, and my, as I said earlier, that my, my mother-in-law and my father-in-law are both doctors, and so uh, one of the homes was on the campus of one of the hospitals my mother was uh, practiced at. So I come in, and uh, they gave me, they give me the they give us the master bedroom or their bedroom, and um, uh, so I get up. So we stayed up. We that night I, I got up the following morning, and uh, was looking for a cup of coffee. And I walk out in the dining room, and my father-in-law has got all these instruments. He's got the stethoscope, and he's got a blood pressure gauge, and he got it, he's got all these things. He's gonna, and um, so I walk by and say good morning to him, and he says sit down. And so I said, in Chinese, in China, in China, Chinese. And how do you say good? <laughs> sit I, down. Do you remember? He speaks. He, <laughs> Sutra, he speaks actually Sutranese, and uh, there's Which two is languages. What? Oh, okay. There's two languages. They both speak. So he, he um, says, sit down, and I sit, sit down, and he gives me a complete physical. <laughs> oh my gosh. And then, and come, and meanwhile, I just as he's. But physical, hold on, not. He didn't do a prostate well, check, right? Avoided, the only thing he avoided was a cough test, okay. and, if you, and if you're not male, you don't know what I'm talking about. And so, uh, meanwhile, my wife walks in, and I said, you're not going to believe this. And she's looking, well, believe what? Your dad just gave me a complete physical, <laughs> oh and I'm not sure if he's happy. <laughs> and why is he not happy? Well, I don't know if he, he wants me to die tomorrow, or he's glad that I'm going to live forever. <laughs> oh, my was, gosh. Yeah, that's a heck of a way to... Uh... To wake up in the morning, and um, so then, then we were. So I get to meet. You know, we get to talking, and and they find out that I'm, I'm a fairly decent guy, and you know, and they want to give us a dowry, and I and they, and I don't want any. I said, hey, I told my wife, I said, we don't need the money. We don't need. I don't. No, you have to take it because it's face. Face means it's very important to China. So my father and law and I go down, and I agree reluctantly that we're going to take this dowry. So we go down to the bank, and he's going to get, going to get us some money. So now this is the first time that outside of him giving me the physical, and I'm alone with him. So we go to the bank, and he goes in, and I, he, he gets some, he gets the money, and he comes back out, and he, we're standing in the street, and he said, "I'm going to tell you three things." And what's that? He says, "Keep your head down, mouth shut, and stay out of trouble." <laughs> and so I obeyed him, and I was never in trouble, never close to it in all the years I was in China. Which was 28, you said? Well, 28, 28 years, but this was a lot. You know, I spent it. After we were married in 2000, it was, 16, it was 16 years before we came to the States. Wise words. And you have, for how many years did you work in the fitness industry? 50, uh, I just started in 72, so over, over 50 years. Over 50 years. How many miles did you accumulate through the airlines in that in, period of time? In, just in United Airlines, just United with their few, on their few, this, United on the few side, two and a half million miles, and I probably have another million, million and a half miles in other airlines, so maybe three, four million miles. So uh, maybe that doesn't add up, maybe four million miles. There's probably not too many people in the world with more miles than you. No. I wouldn't I ran think. Into some guy that had five million, and they, you know, they, wow. There's, there's some road warriors out there. That's incredible, John. Well, one so, of my longest trips was 62 days on the road. 62 days straight. 62 days. I was in 17, 17 airplanes, 17 airlines, and 20, 24 hotels. So oh my so, word! So, I never came home. I never went back to China. I was all over Asia, out of one suitcase. Well, your wife truly loves you with all that travel, and I know you have a daughter yeah. who's now 19, 18. 18, 18. And she did she just join the Marines? She's joined. Uh, she'll be officially joining the Marines in uh, on Friday. 
Good for her. Congratulations. Well, she's I'm in college sure, right now. I'm sure you're, well, I know you're proud. That, it is. And it just was to, her decision, not mine. You yeah. know, I support it 100%. Yeah, absolutely. So, John, give, a, give our listeners some, maybe some tips or maybe some secrets to staying young. Because, I mean, you're, you're 80, but I'm 56, and when I talk to you, I feel like we're, you're just so in shape and strong and witty and smart and tell what, what's your secret is there a secret well I think that um, basically well not basically I think that it all originates from from uh, a good parent a good upbringing I had um, one of the I, I, I thank I, had some, I thank every day for my parents uh, bringing us up with uh, with the work ethic that we have and with the uh, uh, everything, they were, they were just it was a great upbringing. Traveling all over the world and, and uh, having my twin brother. I mean, it was just and then with the attitude we had this uh, work ethic that uh, you did the best you can. Don't embarrass the. My father would say, "Don't embarrass the family," <laughs> and um, it was. Uh, I think that's one of them. And I started exercising in fitness at, at an early age, played sports. I think that uh, keeping fit is so important. Uh, we uh, ate healthy. Uh, we lived within our means. Uh, it was so it was, um, uh, and, I, and I, I, I attribute it to my wife. Hey, if for you old guys out there, marry a young woman. <laughs> it's, it's very helpful. <laughs> so, John, here you are, 80 years old, even though I would guess you're in your upper 60s. But what is your regimen? Like, do you, do you work out every day? Do you work out every other day? What, what's kind of your secret? I know you've been doing this a long time. Well, what I try to do is I try to work out for a uh, minimum of four days a week. Because I need, I believe that you need to take some rest, and um, so I have been doing this. I don't do a lot of uh, aerobics. Uh, what I do is I do strength training, but I get my heart rate level up to about 130, and I don't rest in between uh, sets. And so I, and I have two different programs. One is Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and the other one is Tuesdays, Thursdays. And if I miss one day during the week, then I'll pick up a Saturday, and. Um, so that's that's kind of my routine, and um, do I'm, you like to use free weights and machines? Do you like to mix it up? Or? I mix it up. Mm -hmm. I'm, I mix up. Uh, I think that free weights is just as is very important, but I also think there's there's machines that we developed. Yeah. Um, that um, are just as are just as good, if you can use that word, just as good or uh, as a free weight. Sure, it gives you a little variety and. Yes, you you need a variety in order because it, uh, you, you need it to stimulate yourself mentally and to challenge yourself and there's and to change combinations because it, it influences or affects different muscle groups and so it's um, uh, you need to do that you need the variety yeah, or you get bored. So you know, have have you had Botox? Have you had a facelift? I mean, what what's going on here? Do you take all kinds of Supplements? What? I take. I don't take any drugs. I don't take any any kind of cosmetic surgery. No drugs at all. None. No prescription meds. None. Nothing at all. None. And how's uh, your How's your blood pressure? And blood that? pressure right now. I just had a physical uh, last week. It's 116 over 68. My uh, my resting pulse rate is 55. Tremendous. It's really a a remarkable thing. To see someone that's 80 years old that honestly looks like they're in their 60s and has triceps that could could probably rival Schwarzenegger. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, that's that's well. Thank you very much for that. I, some of this I have to, most of it I have to attribute it to my my family. Uh, my uh, the average uh, age in our family is 95, and so if that. If that is true and accurate, then I have another 15 more years to go. Terrific. And normally, uh, when uh, at the time of my my family passing away, they're in good health up to the time, and um, so it wasn't something that they were in a hospital for 
eight months under uh, you know under super, uh, medical supervision, 24 hours, and no, they just passed away very comfortably. I had an aunt that died at 107, and my mother died at 97, and they're both arguing who's going to die first. <laughs> Well, you know, we've talked about this. Um, I keep giving you a hard time about it. I really, truly believe you should write a book. And uh, you, you've, had, you've had so many experiences, many of which we haven't even discussed today. But <clears throat> you could certainly write a good one, and I know it would be well-read. Uh, John, I could talk to you all day. Uh, Mr. Triceps here, he's, you've got, he's got the triceps of people a third his age. Looks like you're a gymnast or something. Unbelievable. <laughs> well, thank you for your military service. Thank you for being a friend. Thanks for uh, thank you. just inspiring people in and outside the gym. And uh, we just appreciate your great attitude and your work ethic and your wit. And, uh, well, thank you, Don. Well, and it's a pleasure working out at your club as well. I mean, this is... Uh, my, my wife just joined the club because her office is right down the street from there, and she finds it. And my daughter uh, trains there as well. It's a family affair. It's a family <laughs> affair. It's a great club. Oh, yeah. thank you, John. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll see you around the gym. Thank you, sir. This podcast is brought to you by the popular books Wellness Toolbox 1 and 2, as well as 30 Greatest Weight Loss Tips. Get your copies today at local Durango businesses such as Nature's Oasis, Durango Natural Foods, James Ranch Market, Fit247 Gym, and on Amazon.